PSA webinar experience. Uh, my name is Jordan Gray, and I am the Communications and Outreach Coordinator for the Turtle Survival Alliance. And I'm really excited about this topic. It is near and dear to my heart. I have worked on uh, road crossings and road mortality uh, for years, and it's a passion that I would like to share with you all. So we're just going to give a couple minutes for everybody to come in, and uh, then I'm going to introduce you all to our master of ceremonies, David Hedrick. Um, by the way, this is streaming on YouTube as well where it will live. So if you'd like to go back and watch the webinar or share with friends, then you will be able to do so on YouTube in perpetuity. Um, so I would like to introduce David Hedrick um, to the scene uh, so that he can give you some housekeeping rules um, because he will be behind the scenes directing the show. So David, take it away. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And uh, we're looking forward to talking about uh, an issue that we all either have or continue to uh, interact with. Just today, just down the street, I managed to uh, help a box turtle across the road. So it's that time of year. Anyway, <clears throat> we welcome your questions. Please utilize the Q&A feature in Zoom at the bottom of your screen and ask your questions there. We want to avoid asking questions in chat in the chat feature so that it doesn't get super cluttered up because we won't find them there. Just put them in Q&A and when uh, we reach the question and answer session, that's where we'll be pulling those questions from. And um, if you need anything at all, you can raise your hand or send me a chat message and we'll go from there. Thanks. All right, thank you, David. All right, well, let's get started talking about why did the turtle cross the road and what you can do. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen here so we can pull up this PowerPoint. And there we go. Okay, so why did the turtle cross the road and what you can do? Um, this is a busy season right now. Uh, throughout the Northern Hemisphere and in places in the Southern Hemisphere, turtles are busy. They are busy crossing roads, they are busy feeding and foraging, um, and they are very much a part of our lives. I don't think I can find a single day right now where there I don't receive some sort of call or message or even see on some sort of social media site about turtles crossing the road and very much people asking, what do we do? And so that's a, uh, a topic that I hope we can get across here and especially in the Q&A later on in the program. We might not be able to cover everything today, but hopefully we can cover a lot. And I'm really looking forward to your questions at the end. Um, so let me... There we go. Let's first start with who is the TSA for those of you who are unfamiliar. So the TSA is the Turtle Survival Alliance. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit conservation organization that was formed in 2001 in response to the Asian turtle crisis. We are committed to zero turtle extinctions. The TSA, you have to think of as an umbrella. We're a diverse assemblage of organizations, institutions, and individuals with a passion for saving turtles. Strategic partnerships are our core strength, plus, of course, a lot of really extraordinary people like you can see in this photo here. Together with our partners, the TSA is the largest and most comprehensive tortoise and turtle conservation organization on the earth. And really, it comes down to individual turtle conservationists who dedicate their lives to saving turtles. So the TSA um, takes on our conservation actions uh, through a three-pronged approach. Restoring populations in the wild, 
securing species in captivity through assurance colonies and building the capacity to restore, secure, and conserve species within their range countries. All right, that being said, let's get to turtledom and some turtle history. Now, as you all probably know, turtles have been on Earth for a long time, a very, very long time. Uh, the very first turtle ancestor in the fossil record is an animal called Eunotosaurus, which first arose about 260 million years ago. Um, and they continued to evolve for millions and millions of years. As for our modern day turtles, they first showed up in the fossil record about 120 million years ago in the form of soft shell turtles. And of course, they continued to evolve over millions of years. In fact, throughout all of turtle history, it wouldn't be until about 200,000 years ago that Brad Pitt and other modern day humans would come into the world of turtles. And it wasn't until 135 years ago that we would introduce automobiles into their existence. So if you look at it mathematically, humans and automobiles have been around for only about one one millionth of a percent of the history of modern day turtles. And yet we have forever changed the fates of turtles and turtle populations. So let's look at our, our world of roads. As you all know, worlds cover the, uh, excuse me, roads cover the world now. Uh, there are very few places on earth, except for maybe Antarctica, um, where you cannot find roads. Uh, from um, the inner metropolitan cities to the most remote locations like this uh, desert scene here, roads are now a, a part of our life. They really stretch across the world like fungal mycelia or the roots of a tree. If you were to look at any map, you will see roads crisscrossing all over. And that poses a threat to wildlife, including turtles and tortoises. If you look all across the world of turtledom, uh, which is um, shown by these red areas, you will find roads. And the 359 living taxa of turtle and tortoise are affected by these roads. And this poses an existential threat to them on an annual basis. So let's talk about home ranges and the necessities of turtles, because this is really important for you to understanding what you should do in a turtle road crossing scenario. So we're going to look at this slide as a hypothetical home range of this female North American wood turtle. The wood turtle is a semi-aquatic species that is native to the Eastern and Great Lakes regions of the United States and Canada. And in this seemingly uh, remote area, this home range should provide everything that this turtle needs for its um, existence. It should be able to provide food. It should be able to provide water, shelter, and for the population's continua continuance reproduction. So let's look at that turtle's population in equilibrium. For a turtle population to remain stable, the majority of adults must survive from year to year. New hatchlings must be recruited into the population on a consistent basis. A female turtle must successfully reproduce excuse me, replace herself and a male in that population during her lifetime through reproduction. Any increase in mortality to adults must be offset by increased recruitment and survivorship of hatchlings. But the pervasiveness of roads across the landscape, like I said, 
poses an existential threat to the stability of turtle populations. So let's look at home ranges and how home ranges of turtles have been altered over time. A really, really good example I want to show you is that of the eastern box turtle. And this is a real life example. This actually occurred in the state of Maryland, USA in the uh, mid 2000s. So if we look at turtle one, this is a male Eastern box turtle who has a significant home range of about 100 acres. Uh, turtle number two is a female Eastern box turtle whose home range is only about uh, 10 acres. Um, however, in this scenario, neither turtle has any real existential threat posed to them by roads back in 1989. However, if we actually look, we can see that in 2002, changes began happening to the landscape. For both turtles, you can see a new development started taking place uh, within areas that were formerly woodlands and open fields. If we move on to 2007, you can see that that community is now well established and that other roads are starting to form. And then we see that there's construction beginning to the right and the left um, of these turtle home ranges. And that is a large bypass that is starting to be put through. This bypass is going to pose an existential threat to these turtles home ranges. And as you can see in 2009, the progress continues. In 2010, it is becoming more and more of a threat. And now in 2021, both home ranges of the turtles are impacted by not only this bypass that sits in uh, the middle of their home ranges, but also the communities that have developed around it. So let's go back and look at Turtle 1 versus Turtle 2 in 1989, and then fast forward to 2021, and we can see that there is a litany of threats that the box turtles would now encounter within their respective home ranges. And one thing to consider is that the Eastern box turtle may live for 100 years or more. And so it is very likely that these two turtles lived through all of these changes. Um, and if they didn't, it is because these changes uh, came about during their lifespan. Something else to take into account is that if these turtles are, are still reproductively viable and new hatchlings are being recruited into the population, the home ranges of those hatchlings must now, from the time they hatch from the egg, and as they slowly develop as that turtle grows, um, must take into account and be dynamic with that habitat around them. A lot of times I hear people say, well, the road was built into the turtle's home. And in this example, we see that yes, the road was built into the turtle's home. But let's say turtles who are uh, 10 years old or younger, uh, they have now hatched and live in this environment and must be able to uh, survive in a very human impacted world. Something else about roads that you might not really think about is that they can actually act as a double edged sword. They can be an attractant for turtles. These uh, photos were taken by my friend Ken Sofer in the, in the Midwest, and these are ornate box turtles. And you can see on the left, after a rainstorm, the road actually serves as a reservoir for water where the turtles can come up and drink. However, this of course uh, provides a scenario where the turtle is now at increased threat of an automobile interaction. On the right, you can see that this ornate box turtle 
is chewing on a large lubber grasshopper. Roads um, can be a, an attractant source because of the food they offer, much like opossums and armadillos scavenging roads at night, turtles too will scavenge roads for roadkill. And this again, puts them at risk of an automobile interaction. Another way they can act as an attractant is by actually providing nesting grounds. Um, in many of these habitats, when a road is put in and shoulders are created, they have now created open sunny areas in what may have been a forested canopy in the past. Uh, this photo is from Wisconsin and was provided by, by my friend, Andrew Badgie. And this is a female Blandings turtle who is nesting right alongside the road. So not only is this a threat to her nesting alongside the road, even though the road provides soils that might be um, uh, preferable or optimal for nesting, but when her hatchlings emerge from the soil, this road can now pose as a threat to the hatchlings as they start their own home ranges and move to the water bodies in which they will reside for the rest of their life. So let's look at frequency of occurrence because this can really, really matter. So first off, turtles make uh, movements out of necessity. Uh, to fulfill individual and population needs. If you think about that wood turtle scenario from just a few minutes ago, those wood turtles um, might move across the landscape to look for the food, the water, the shelter, or reproductive sites. And for that population, that turtle needs to be able to receive all those necessities and be able to reproduce. So that is where it comes down to both a fundamental uh, uh, individual level and uh, fundamentals for the population's continuance. Depending on the individual turtle or turtle population, road encounters may be a regular part of their annual cycle, an occasional or rare occurrence, or a first time interaction. But no matter the, free, the reason or the frequency, each encounter can be deadly. Right now, especially during these summer months, May, June, and July, female turtles are disproportionately subject to road encounters as they seek out nesting grounds to lay their eggs. So let's look at a scenario. And this is a very, very basic scenario but it's using the Blandings turtle, which is very optimal for uh, this scenario depiction. So the Blandings turtle is a turtle that occupies a very large home range. Uh, they will also utilize many different types of habitats within a single season. But let's just say this female Blandings turtle, her, her primary home range is within the shallows of this lake. And she has just woken up from her long winter's nap and is now looking to utilize other habitats within her large home range. And in the spring, those habitats might be these shallow prairie potholes um, or ephemeral or temporary wetlands. But if you look, they are on the other side of this road. So early in the season, this female turtle already has the potential for an automobile interaction on this road. All right, so let's say she's now spent the time in those seasonal wetlands, the shallow wetlands foraging for amphibian larvae, crayfish, um, finding males to mate with. And now those pools are drying up, the heat of summer is kicking in, and so she's gonna move back to the refuge of her deeper water uh, lake environment. Again now, twice in a season, she is at the potential for an interaction with an automobile. So now this female turtle, it's, this, it's summertime, she's gravid, meaning that she, her body is full of eggs 
and it is time to seek out nesting areas. Well, as you can see by these um, uh, polygons I've created, there are actually several places that she could choose to nest. Um, some of these may be more preferential than others. And this is one of the things that makes you ask, why did the turtle cross the road? The polygon closest to her uh, is a gravel parking lot that was created. This little loop where uh, cars could potentially turn around or park. Maybe they're gonna walk down the trail and go fishing at the lake. Uh, the one above that is this nice sandy loamy soil uh, alongside the road. Uh, to the upper left, you see some sand dunes. Maybe that's where she initially hatched many years ago and then began creating that home range. Or she could have come from that gravel road on the other side. Either way, there's many options for her to nest, but if you look at it in reality, all of those present cases where she could have a road encounter. So for this Blanding's turtle in any one given season or across a number of seasons, the frequency in which she has a road encounter may increase. And I just have to say that the Blanding's turtle is a, it's an imperiled species uh, throughout the states and provinces in which it lives. Luckily for the Blanding's turtle, they are one of high conservation priority and there's a lot of really, really great programs across their range to bring uh, attention to the community about their crossings. Um, there are uh, many turtle hospitals uh, who take in Blanding's turtles in the summertime. A big shout out to the uh, Ontario Turtle Conservation Center uh, because they take in many Blanding's turtles uh, during the summer in Ontario. That's a program I really suggest you checking out. Uh, so this is a highly charismatic species with a large home range and one who very much uh, has threats to its survival because of roads. So this was actually kind of a simple scenario. Um, the next, uh, uh, and again, the turtle coming back would be another one uh, of an area where she is at a, uh, the chance of a road interaction. So now I'm gonna get to a little more of a confusing scenario. And this is actually the scenario where I've been working for the last 16 years documenting the road mortality. And this really makes you beg the question, why did the turtles cross the road? So on the left, we have turtle one. It's a diamondback terrapin female who is inhabiting this nice river on one side of this coastal causeway. That white line that you see um, uh, stretching uh, across the screen is an old railroad track that is now a trail. That could offer some areas for turtle nesting. And then we have turtle two who is coming from the salt marshes. Uh, and actually turtle two, that is from the south and turtle one is from the north. Any of these areas along the coastal causeway and that trail could be used as nesting areas by the terrapins. And in fact, they are. So for turtle one, who is moving south to look for those nesting areas, uh, in two scenarios, she would not be at, uh, at threat of a road interaction. But in your lower one, if she were to decide to cross the road to nest, which they do, she, is, uh, she puts herself at threat of a road interaction. If we look at turtle number two, there are two scenarios in which she may cross the road to nest. And there's another scenario where she may choose the shoulder on the south side of the road to nest. Well, two of these provide a scenario for a road interaction. If you put these together, turtles traveling from north to south or south to north have, uh, over the course of years, many times in which they may come in contact with automobiles. And so what does that look like on our uh, data graph? Well, it looks like this. This is 2019. This is that causeway 
And these are turtles traveling north to south and south to north. So it really makes you ask the question, why did the turtle cross the road? What you're looking at is about 150 dead females during that one summer nesting season. And that is pretty typical for us along the causeway. Uh, the road mortality along this causeway has caused such impacts to the generation time in this population that we actually see that the female turtles typically only live between five to eight years until they die, which means that they might have one, two, and maybe three nesting seasons until uh, they are no longer in the population, meaning that they have to recruit new individuals on a consistent basis because the adult females are turning over so rapidly. This is not a normal situation, but it's something that we very much have to take into account. All right, so you wanna help. Well, first off, uh, this is me in 2007, by the way. Um, I wouldn't say go out and stand in the road with a turtle crossing sign. Uh, this is, of course, just for a photo op. Uh, we have our Abbey Road of Terrapins, but I want you all to understand how you can help in these scenarios. And I'm also gonna give you basically a little example of a turtle kit that I carry with me in my cart all times during this season. Number one, that safety vest. Having a brightly colored reflective safety vest is always important at this time of year, should you be inclined to, to help to help turtles cross this road. That safety vest is going to uh, make you stand out on the road. And from most people's uh, interactions with roads and people working with roads, they recognize that safety vest as somebody who's, who is doing work on the causeway. In this case, you helping a turtle out. Next thing I tend to have is a towel in the car. And that towel is actually for the turtles, not for you, even though Yes, you may be going to the beach afterwards. Another item I have is an, an opaque tote. And I have to tell you right now that opaque tote is not for you to bring turtles home. That opaque tote I carry around in case a turtle needs immediate veterinary help or to be taken to a wildlife rehabilitation center. Uh, and really quick, let me go back. The reason that I use opaque totes instead of transparent is to decrease the stress on the turtle. If that turtle is injured from having a road inter interaction with an automobile or some other type of motorized vehicle, it's already going to be in a great state of stress. So having a dark environment uh, will help decrease that animal's stress in an already stressful environment. Next, hand sanitizer. That should be pretty, uh, basic why you should have hand sanitizer. Polaroid, po polarized sunglasses are a great thing to have in your car. They will help you look for turtles on the road and help you uh, uh, really with your distance gauging uh, for a turtle. Uh, especially during this time of year, there are other animals that have been hit on roads. So helping you to decipher between what's a turtle and what's not. Shoot, it might even be a piece of rubber on the road and you need to be able to differentiate that between a turtle in a very, very rapid amount of time. The other thing you're always gonna want to have in your, and this is in your phone, is a number to call for somebody that could help. So that number could be your local wildlife center or rescue, that number could be for a veterinarian, or it could be your contact for the TSA or another a uh, uh, turtle biologist like the, uh, your local Department of Natural Resources. And of course, a shameless plug, there's nothing better than having an amazing TSA I Break for Turtles bumper sticker on your car to let everybody know that you are breaking for turtles. Okay, so when do turtles cross the road? Well, turtle movement and road interactions often occur during morning hours, after rainfall, excuse me, rainfall, or in temporal 
bursts associated with nesting activity or environmental changes. So right now, of course, we are seeing uh, lots of rainfall in many areas as uh, summer really sets in. Uh, during summer, uh, the middle of the day is quite hot. So for the turtle being an ectothermic or cold-blooded animal, those early morning hours are the most suitable for their activity, for them to find water, for them to find um, refuge for later in the day, and for feeding. Uh, and then we're also seeing environmental changes, and that might create a burst in activity, such as a pond drying up, and now the turtles are going to search for a new water source. All right, so we've gotten there. There it is, a dark object lumbering up ahead. And you have decided through your professional skills at identifying turtles crossing the road that it is indeed a turtle. What do you do? Well, the first thing you don't do is you don't break because there are most likely going to be other cars behind you. Yes, there may be situations in which you are on a very rural road and there are no other cars, but the first thing you should always do is check all of your mirrors. This should just be standard. And you wanna do this immediately because you need to know your surroundings, mostly because your adrenaline is pumping. And if you're like us, the first thing on your mind is let's save that turtle. But you also have to remember one thing, and that is self-preservation and the preservation of other human beings. Yes, turtle lives are very, very important, but so is your own and so are the lives of others. So you've checked your mirrors, and the next thing you wanna immediately do to let other cars know that something is happening in your car is you need to turn on your hazard lights. This will immediately let the cars behind and in front of you know that you are most likely going to slow down and or um, maneuver in some way in which they need to account for. All right, so now you've gotten over to the side of the road into a safe space. And of course, you always wanna get in the safe space. Don't stop in the middle of the road because this could cause a pileup. I have seen it so many times where somebody stops in the middle of the road on a busy causeway or street to a break for a turtle. And I have seen cars swerve off the road or almost run into the back of other cars. And this can cause serious collision leading to injury or death uh, of other humans, including yourself. So once you've pulled over, what do you need to do? You need to check your surroundings again, check your mirrors. Don't just immediately hop out of the car, run out and get that turtle. Again, that turtle is important, but you are more important. So now you are out of uh, you are out of your car, and um, and you are ready uh, to get that turtle. Well, the easiest thing to do is to wait for any traffic to either slow down, see what you're doing and then go out, pick up the turtle, and continue in the direction that you are heading. It's simple, it's forward momentum, okay? So you're gonna wanna pick up that turtle and just keep going, because there still may be cars that are coming and not really understanding what you're doing. All right, so now you're safely to the other side. Well, you're safely to the other side with a turtle. You have the turtle in hand, but as you can see, and this was actually a turtle that I helped out of the road uh, a week and a half ago, there is still a lot of traffic that you have to take into account. But the thing that should be in your mind is that that turtle was heading in the direction it was heading for a reason, some instinct-based necessity. And most likely that road is within its home range. Sure, there are scenarios where it may not be, but likely that road is within its home range. So you need to take the turtle uh, in the direction it was heading. That is the simplest thing that you can do for that turtle. And then release it into the habitat on the other side of the road. And of course, 
wish it good luck. I know it sits in your heart. What is going to happen to that turtle? But the fact of the matter is, like if you look at this turtle here that I helped across the road, that turtle is about a 10-year-old turtle, meaning that it has survived on its own. You know, there might be a turtle that's 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, and it has survived for all those decades. You have to remember that you are not that turtle's destiny, but that you are merely assisting it, and luckily for the turtle, at the right place at the right time to let it continue going on its way. So here are some simple do's and don'ts. Do take the turtle to the other side of the road in the direction it was heading and release it in the habitat. Do take the turtle to a wildlife center or a veterinarian if it's injured. Do contact help if you're not sure what to do or you need assistance. And I really stress that because there are a lot of scenarios that don't fit just that simple scenario of taking the turtle to the other side. Seek help when it's appropriate. Do not return the turtle from the direction from which it was coming. It might simply turn back and try to cross the road again. Do not relocate the turtle somewhere else. Remember, turtles have home ranges. They have built this home range from the time they are hatchlings. And to take this turtle out of the home range not only takes that turtle out of the population that so desperately uh, relies upon it, but you are now taking the turtle to a foreign destination. Yes, there are scenarios in which turtles do need to be translocated, but that's when it's best to bring in professional wildlife professionals I just said professionals twice, but that's okay to help you make that decision. And last one, and I really, really want to stress, do not take the turtle home as a pet. We see this so often. People have turtles at home that they say, I saved this turtle from the road. Look, the fact of the matter is, if you want to save that turtle, take it to the other side of the road and release it. Keep wild turtles wild. There is a chance that given 15 more seconds, that turtle actually would have been able to cross the road just fine on its own. Maybe it wouldn't have, but either way, if you take that turtle home, it is now just as dead to the wild population had it been hit by a car. So just think of it this way, break for me, but do not take me, coming from a turtle. All right, but what if there are those scenarios that are just mind boggling, like this one that I dealt with last week? If you look at this, where this turtle was found, and I'm actually showing you, this turtle was crossing a road in a very, very urban environment or suburban environment. There are many different options from, for where this turtle could have been coming from. And I had to make the best uh, decision based on uh, the information that I had uh, to relay back to the person who found that turtle. And in these scenarios, I really suggest getting assistance. So who are you gonna call? Where are you gonna get assistance from? Well, you can uh, first look to your local wildlife center or wildlife rescue. Look for a professional herpetologist, especially one who has uh, experience with turtles, um, so that they can give you the best uh, knowledge of that area. Next, you can contact the Turtle Survival Alliance. Look, we deal with these kind of questions all the time, and we love to help people out. Um, during this time of year, uh, I know I and others from the TR TSA are fielding phone calls, emails, uh, DMs. We found a turtle crossing the road, or maybe we found a turtle in our yard. What do we do with it? Well, you can contact me directly, jgray at turtlesurvival.org. And I also recommend, if you do that, ccing info at turtlesurvival.org. And that will make sure that that email is immediately seen and we can get in touch with you to deal with your turtle situation. There's also a lot of groups out there, like on Facebook. 
One which I really recommend because I have a lot of friends on there who I know and trust will give good advice is Wild Turtle and Tortoise Discussion. Join that group. It'll be a great one for you to be able to post some of those alternate scenarios that might not be so cut and dry. Also, make contact an exotic veterinary clinic. Again, especially if that turtle is injured. Uh, local non-emergency police, okay? If there's a turtle crossing the road, please don't call 911. Please call a non-emergency number and maybe they will be able to dispatch an officer that could help you. You wouldn't believe how many times I have seen police officers stop traffic to help turtles cross the road. So my heart definitely goes out to all the officers out there who do that on a regular basis. What if there's a bigger, uh, a, a bigger issue at hand, like that scenario I showed you at the causeway that uh, my colleagues and I work on? Well, getting the Department of Transportation involved and of course uh, your other local uh, departments involved, your municipal departments involved is something that will really benefit that in the long run. So what can be done? Well, first, let's look at caution signs. Um, there are projects all over the world that use turtle caution signs, and they can be really good at alerting motorists that turtles are crossing. But I do want to just point out a few things that I think should always uh, be incorporated in turtle crossing signs and with their implementation. Um, number one, what you wanna do is say that there are turtles or terrapins or tortoises crossing. Having a silhouette of that animal is great. It, 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 it should be a universally recognized symbol of a turtle. Next, caution, May to July, like you see on this sign. It shows that temporal time in a year when drivers should be on their highest alert. And by the way, this road signage is from the Downing Musgrove Causeway between Brunswick and Jekyll Island, Georgia. And let me tell you, I don't know of any road project that is as well oiled of a machine as this one is and is based out of the Georgia Sea Turtle Center. They have such a high rate of uh, turtle rescues on the causeway because they have got this down to a science. Now, in the long term for this causeway, what they really wanna do is be able to implement the wildlife barriers and tunnels. On the right-hand side, you can see that when implemented correctly, this can really, really reduce turtles crossing the road. Now, this uh, requires a lot of time, a lot of planning, and a lot of expense. This particular uh, wildlife barrier and tunnel is at a high uh, density site of turtle crossing in Ontario, uh, which is being worked on by our TSA representative in Ontario, Marc Dupuy des I just really messed up your name there, Mark, in case you're watching. I think I do, it's probably a new uh, iteration every single time I say it, but either way, um, he's working um, in collaboration with our friends at Animex Fencing on this project here. So who should you contact if you want to be involved in those larger initiatives? First, your state, regional, or provincial wildlife resources department. You need to contact them and say, look, we have a problem and we need to do something about it. Next, uh, or at the same time, you can contact your Department of Transportation ecologists. Department of Transportation have these ecologists because roads do impact the landscapes in which they lie in and the habitats and wildlife um, that will be impacted by them when they are laid in the landscape. And of course, you can always contact the Turtle Survival Alliance, because we're always glad to help. We have a vast network, and so we can help put you in touch with the right person to help mitigate turtle road crossings wherever you may be. So with that said, I want to say thank you 
I hope there's some great questions. And then we'll play a little video All right, here beautiful guy. That turtle we're taking you in the direction you were heading left. across this treacherous four lane highway into some habitat. That is your home range. So here we go. Going back home safely. What a beautiful turtle, by the way. And I loved seeing him go back into the wild where they should be. <clears throat> All right, be safe. There he goes, trucking along. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I hope there's some great questions because we have time for Q&A. David Hedrick, the Master of Ceremonies has been compiling those questions and uh, let's chat. The first question is from Anita Eisman and she would like to know how far off the road should we take turtles when we move them on across? That's a really good question. Um, would I, if you look at that video that I just showed, um, I did take it until it was in a uh, habitat that provided significant, significant cover for it to continue on its way. But of course, there's many different scenarios. Um, there might not be, it might be very, very dense. And so what I tend to say is uh, take it a reasonable distance where the turtle is going to continue into habitat where they feel safe and secure um, and hopefully not turn around and go back the other way. Next question is, is from Krista and she would like to know if any of our U.S. species are considered threatened or endangered or if and if that might play a role in um, some of the transportation projects going through. And I suppose as well with whether or not um, state agencies might pay more attention to potential road crossing issues at specific sites. All right, really? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so one of the things that we have to look at is there, there are of course roads that are, roads are everywhere now and they are in the habitat of many imperiled species, like the Blandings turtle, like I showed, like the wood turtle, uh, gopher tortoises in the Southeast, desert tortoises in the Southwest. Um, and sometimes one can use the, that endangerment status uh, or that imperiled status to try to bolster the argument for uh, incorporating uh, uh, wildlife barriers and uh, tunnel designs beneath the roads. Um, one of the things that I always uh, try to uh, look at is in these scenarios, um, when is the Department of Transportation in, air, in that area already going to be working on a road and trying to then incorporate the wildlife issues uh, into maybe an already proposed project. Because the truth of the matter is, is wildlife barriers and tunnels, uh, implementing those into existing roadways can be a very, very expensive endeavor. Um, even just a short um, uh, segment of road can cost hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. Um, but that's also where, again, like you said, um, using um, the, the turtle's endangerment status to bolster the argument to put those type of barriers in. Um, something else I do want to point out also is if one is inclined to help turtles, and, you know, I was going through my whole uh, turtle kit that I keep in the car, is that um, you, may, you might be dealing with threatened or endangered species. And in many cases, you might actually have to have a permit to be able to handle those animals. And so that's where I always suggest, like I did in, in those slides, is having the number of uh, your state wildlife agency, state or provincial, 
a, a local herpetologist, a state herpetologist, because um, it's oftentimes good just to have them in on the loop of what you're doing. Now, in the, in the heat of the moment, though, um, you know, you're, you're pulling over uh, to help a Blandings turtle across the road. Um, I think that the turtle moving across the road safely, uh, unharmed, um, is in the best interest of that turtle and that turtle's population. But what you can always do is then uh, send a, that coordinate of where that turtle was to your state or provincial or regional wildlife department to say, here is where this turtle was and this is what I did. Great question. Excellent. Kate asks, does every state have a Department of Transportation ecologist? Uh, department, so uh, they should. Um, the, because, the, because the Department of Transportation um, deals with many issues involving various habitats in which roadways are being laid in, um, I believe uh, that these Departments of Transportation all have uh, uh, employed ecologists. Uh, and also in many cases, they uh, will, will contract out to environmental consulting firms to do impact studies uh, in those areas. Brian Bauer asks, what should you do if you're finding turtles in areas where they are not native to? That's a great question. And I also know, so Brian Bowers, by the way, uh, he's an affiliate of ours at TSA. He is now working in Hawaii. And so there are no native freshwater turtles or tortoises to Hawaii. And I know from speaking with Brian regularly that uh, they find lots of non-native turtles and tortoises. Uh, what I would recommend in those scenarios is taking those animals to a wildlife center or to uh, getting in, in touch with somebody who does turtle or tortoise adoptions uh, so that those turtles uh, can then still continue their life, but not in a way that may impact native species. We see this all the time with red-eared sliders, yellow-bellied sliders, uh, and there are also other turtle species that have become highly invasive in habitats in which they are non-native to. Julia asks, do all species of turtles have home ranges? Um, so home ranges are uh, ubiquitous uh, among turtles and tortoises. The size, however, is not. So let's go back to those, like that box turtle example we had before. Uh, one box turtle may have a home range of 100 to 150 acres, while another box turtle in that same population uh, may have a home range of one acre or less. It's really dependent on the individual uh, as well as uh, the individual's needs. Um, but then if you look at other species of turtles, uh, they may actually... Uh, utilize, um, they may travel uh, tens to sometimes hundreds of miles. Uh, we have seen uh, turtles, uh, especially think about sea turtles, uh, they will travel thousands of miles uh, within what one would consider their home range. Now, of course, they're doing that aquatically, um, but we know of a radiated tortoise in Madagascar who will do a 50 kilometer round trip from her winter to her summer uh, grounds uh, on an annual basis. And we know that through radio telemetry. So these uh, home ranges can uh, vary considerably depending on the species and again, that individual turtle. Think of it, you know, not to anthropomorphize too much, but think of it, some people are just homebodies. Some turtles are just homebodies. Some people, uh, they love to get out and travel and same can go for an individual turtle. 
Allison asks, what about snapping turtles? They don't always take kindly to being moved. <laughs> snapping turtles uh, tend not to take kindly to being moved. Um, snapping turtles are oftentimes one of those other scenarios, uh, one in which oftentimes help is required. Uh, especially uh, common snapping turtles um, uh, or your Central American or South American snapping turtles, um, they, are, uh, they have great mobility, uh, they have great speed. Uh, the proper way to pick up a snapping turtle is uh, in the back of the shell, um, getting uh, the, the, your uh, four fingers uh, beneath the rear carapace or the top shell, your thumbs on top and holding it like that. Uh, for decades and decades, uh, even herpetologists were taught to hold snapping turtles by their tail. And um, this is just a practice that um, um, is no longer regarded as appropriate because um, that is, of course, a tail that is attached to a spinal cord and this can significantly injure the turtle. Um, if you find yourself in a scenario with a snapping turtle that is being highly unruly, uh, I do su uh, suggest contacting um, help. Um, and sometimes, and I've seen this before, that could be in the form of your local non-emergency police um, because it might take a little while to get that snapping turtle out of the road. That was a good question. Amy asks, or she says, oh, and my 12 year old rescued a turtle last night from the road that had been hit by a car. We tried to keep it alive until we could get it to a wildlife hospital. The neighbor said that she could have eggs, so we thought we could possibly save those. Would that have been possible? And her son was disappointed to find that she had died from her injuries today. And um, she thinks that he is an animal rescuer in the making or a vet. Uh, well, it sounds like, well, one, I love the fact that the child was, you know, uh, so inquisitive about that aspect, because yes, um, right now, especially gravid or um, egg laden females are being hit by cars. And in many cases, those eggs can be saved. Um, now, again, it depends on the species. Uh, there are various laws that come into play. Um, especially, you know, when it is an imperiled species. But if a turtle that is injured goes to a veterinarian for care and ends up dying, um, uh, the veterinarian can actually perform what's called an eggectomy in which the oviduct is removed from that turtle, the eggs are taken out, put into an incubation medium, and if that veterinarian knows how to incubate the eggs, like they do at the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center, for example, uh, they can hatch those eggs out. Um, again, uh, make sure this is all done under the appropriate permits uh, when necessary. Um, uh, it almost seems uh, like I should do a whole webinar on doing an eggectomy. Um, because it is something that I do uh, on an annual basis. Uh, I do have permits to do this for uh, different species, uh, but it is a way of saving those eggs when the female was lost and the hatchlings uh, being able to be set free into the wild, thereby giving, uh, you know, continuing that mother's genes in the population. Great question. And I love it, yes. Become a vet, and then you can do it all. <laughs> We've got quite a few questions that touch on what the proper steps are to begin addressing like a hot spot issue where a lot of crossings and a lot of road mortality takes place. Who are the agencies to begin getting in touch with first, perhaps the agencies and possibly the local organizations or universities that might can chime in on that kind of thing as well. Right. Um, so 
Um, let's go back to the program with the terrapins on the causeway. So uh, I co-founded that program with Dr. Catherine Craven back in 2004. And so I immediately uh, linked that program to a university. Um, but then we did our activities under the auspices of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. So yeah, let's go through the steps. If there is an area that, had, that you see is, uh, has high turtle mortality, the first thing to do is to, to contact your state, provincial, or regional uh, wildlife resources agency and, and say that we have a problem because they can send uh, people out on a, in a professional capacity to document what you are saying. Um, and if you don't exactly know how to do that or know who to talk to, well, you can contact the TSA because we do this regularly. We put people in touch with who they need to be in touch with uh, to start such programs. And you have to realize that so many of these programs around the world started as citizen science programs, concerned citizens, concerned communities, wanting to start a program to protect the turtles um, in their communities, and especially these turtles that are crossing the roads. So if I have, if I have to put it simply, I'd say first contact um, a, a wildlife agency. Um, and if you need help with that, contact the Turtle Survival Alliance. Aaron asks, are you aware of any citizen science programs currently or surveys where people can participate to report sightings, even if they are state or university or, organ or organization specific data collections? Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great question. So um, we are actually, so uh, working on a, a new app with Animex, Animex is a, is a uh, wildlife solutions company. Um, they're the ones that I was talking about who's working uh, in Ontario. Uh, they're also now working in Georgia. They work in Florida and many other areas uh, to create this app uh, that cit citizens can then input data on, on wildlife crossings and road mortality that will directly go to Animex so that they can understand as a wildlife solutions company where these hot spots are uh, for different species of wildlife. Um, and if you wanna find out more about that, please uh, send me an email at jgray at turtlesurvival.org. I know you addressed this pretty fervently, but I want to want to ask Joaquin's question again here, mm -hmm. so you can say it again. Um, saw someone crossing, or saw a turtle crossing a road, and saw someone decide to pick it up and take it home. What is your thought about that, and what are the repercussions? So, yeah, again, going back to if you pick up a turtle off of a road and take it home to be a pet, that turtle is now effectively dead to the population. And you have to think about the population as a whole. All right, let's say you have a population of 100 turtles. If you were to remove one to two adult turtles from that population per year, in about 50, maybe 75 years, uh, most likely that population will go extinct based on even just that small of removal of adult turtles. Um, now there are different factors at play, um, but what re it really comes down to is that each adult turtle and hatchling and juvenile and subadult matters to that population and its survival. Um, so, if somebody, and, and one of the good things that I've seen about um, uh, the, uh, basically the internet 
really coming into all of our lives is that a lot of that education is becoming more widespread. When people bring a turtle home that they found on the road, uh, you will very quickly see people across the internet telling them to take that turtle back where it came from. Now, one thing I have to say that I do see is sometimes that turtle is actually a non-native species, kind of like Brian Bauer uh, brought up. Um, I had a call about a diamondback terrapin that somebody found on the road and they didn't know what to do with it. I asked them to send me a picture of it and it turned out to be an African helmeted turtle. Um, so if that African helmeted turtle had been released into the salt marsh, that would very much be uh, a non-native habitat for it to be in. Um, and that was, yeah, that was a very unusual call, but um, again, you are you may be saving that turtle in the moment but you are not saving that population when you take a turtle home if you don't know what to do because yeah some scenarios the other side of the road might be a mini mall yeah or you know the a parking lot of a home depot or uh just a, a part of a cul-de-sac and it's you know it's a, a row of houses um, and those are scenarios where let's get in contact with somebody who can help, somebody who can make a, the, the, the best decision based off the information they have. And again, like I've said, here at the TSA, we are happy to do that should you find yourself in that scenario. But as, as a simple thing, keep wild turtles wild. You know, we did have several people ask um, what the general home range size was for box turtles. And as you said, anywhere from one acre up to 100, depending upon the individual. But it ties in again to the second part of the question asked by Julia. Um, and that is, is there any general I, uh, idea about how far is too far to move a turtle from where you find it crossing the road? And if you move it completely out of its range, what are the ramifications possible? All right, those are great questions that have very complex answers and solutions because they are not always cut and dry and we are still learning about these things. Um, so for instance, uh, box turtles. Um, uh, I've se I've seen it uh, some you know something that's traveled around the internet that says a box turtle will only travel one mile in its life. Um, while the message itself is good, basically leave turtles where they are. Uh, there's not much science that really backs up that statement because uh, a, a, a one box turtle may have a very small home range of less than an acre. Another one might have a home range of 50, 100, 150 acres. Um, so, uh, and then you look at all the box turtles in that population and yeah, sure, you can come up with an average or a, a median home range size, um, but turtle, uh, individual turtles, individual turtle movements and especially individual turtle personalities um, yes, these animals do have unique personalities, uh, very much dictate the size of their home range. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, when, let's say, like the slides I was showing of that road coming in, you know, from, from uh, uh, east and west to come converge through that box turtle habitat, um, uh, Turtle home ranges, once established, they can show some amount of uh, dynamism, um, you know, um, because of environmental factors. However, um, if you've ever lived in a suburban neighborhood um, that used to be woodland, uh, you will oftentimes see box turtles living in the fringes or in very small pockets of woodland within those suburban neighborhoods, or you'll find them traversing through the backyards. And that's very much because that established home range oftentimes doesn't actually uh, change in relation 
to uh, human changes to the landscape. Those turtles will oftentimes just use now what they have available to them. Now, that is not always the case. And yes, turtles might uh, change what we'll call the polygon of their home range uh, to find those basic necessities. Now, as far as moving a turtle, um, I have seen turtles uh, moved uh, and rehome 50 miles uh, from where they originally moved from. Do I recommend moving a turtle 50 miles? Absolutely not. That was just because those turtles, the point of origin was not known. In that specific case, uh, the turtles were uh, moved to where the best information uh, at the time was where they came from, uh, but radio telemetry actually showed them rehoming to their natal creeks uh, about 50 miles away. Um, but in, in other scenarios, you know, a box turtle might move a mile, two miles, uh, 20 miles. But if you think about it, that turtle trying to get back home, if it tries to get back home 20 miles away, um, think about all the roads or the litany of other threats that it will now face on its way trying to rehome. And in some cases, once a, a turtle has moved too far outside of its home range, uh, they, they simply can't rehome. Um, again, this is very complex, and I don't have a cut and dried answer for that question. And even the individual personality of the turtle will very much dictate on its ability to rehome, uh, to uh, adjust and adopt a new habitat, uh, and whether it survives. Um, so that is where um, when translocations occur for turtles, um, the best way that we try to do it scientifically, in, and this is actually, and I, and I hope you all get to see this um, uh, relayed uh, through a presentation in our symposium this year, is uh, there was a confiscation of box turtles that was translocated or relocated to the Savannah River Ecology Labs uh, site in Aiken. And, and this was done by professional scientists. And these turtles were put in what's called a soft release pen, meaning that a pen, uh, an enclosed uh, uh, um, habitat, is made within the recipient habitat for these turtles and the recipient population in which these turtles will now interact with. And um, the best way to do those kind of translocations is to allow those turtles to live in those soft release pens for six, 12, 18 months until they become acclimated with that habitat, then uh, basically releasing the walls and allowing the turtles to disperse naturally. But I want y'all to wait and see that talk because Again, it will show that even through those type of methods, there are so many different scenarios with each turtle in that type of translocation regarding their movements, regarding rehoming, or regarding establish, now establishing that site as their new home. So um, definitely, that's something for you all to look forward to in our 19th annual symposium on the conservation and biology of tortoises and freshwater turtles coming to you this August. All right, we're just about to wrap up, but we will answer a couple more questions. Mark sure. Cagle in North Carolina says, in Eastern North Carolina, we've had motorcyclists injured due to hitting yellow belly sliders and red belly turtles this time of year. Mm -hmm. Could this be another way to get support or turtle crossing areas to be highlighted on this? Mark, the, yeah, and Mark's a friend of mine. That is a great question because, again, you see, when, when one tries to implement uh, mitigation efforts for wildlife, 
um, because it can come at such a high uh, uh, financial cost, sometimes it's not always to, uh, you know, the top priority for, say, the Department of Transportation. And that is where you very much should look at the human safety impact. You know, in any of these areas, what I always say is that wildlife crossings present a clear and, and present danger to human life. And uh, one should take that clear and present danger to human life and really say, look, the wildlife is getting in the road. Not only do we not want the wildlife to be hit, but motorcyclists are, you know, are, are uh, 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 you know, care you know, careening off the road because of these animals. Uh, cars, uh, you know, cars are piling up because, uh, you know, uh, uh, some sort of wildlife, maybe a turtle got hit in the road or maybe someone stopped with them. So how do we, uh, how do we reduce the, um, the potential uh, impact to humans with regard to uh, injury or loss of life and protect wildlife at the same time. So Mark brings up a really, really good point in being able to garner community support for an effort that will help both wildlife and humans. All right, we'll let this one be the last one. I'm actually going to mash up a couple of questions together. Okay. One, one from Taylor and um, it is, are there any special precautions to be taken with hatchlings that you might find crossing a road. And in a similar vein, um, someone said that they'd helped a small, very small box turtle across the road. And directly in the direction it was going, there were railroad tracks and large tanker cars and a very kind of dangerous looking spot. And they were asking if it was okay to move that up the road about a hundred yards to where it looks like a slightly better place to cross. Yeah. So that, uh, again, going back to like to the Blanding's turtle example, after those females potentially successfully nest on the other side of that road, well, now the hatchlings also have to cross that road. Um, whenever a hatchling turtle is found, again, just like an adult turtle, the best thing to do is just to release it um, right on the other side of the road into habitat. And the reason I say that is because, again, from the time that turtle first pipped out of its egg, maybe even you know, inside of its egg, when it's a, now a full-term uh, embryo, that home range is starting to be built. Um, that turtle's, uh, the, the various environmental, or um, uh, electromagnetic uh, cues that are guiding that turtle uh, are being built. So um, that little turtles, whether it's its nest to water journey or nest to swamp or nest to prairie, whatever that might be for that turtle is critically important for it creating its home range. But yes, what if there are, you, you know, right on the other side of that road are train tracks. Um, I think in my, if it were me and I were taking that hatchling, I would walk it across the road to the other side of the train tracks and let it go on its way. Train tracks are a whole nother issue and they are an issue uh, that again, just like roads poses an existential threat to turtles and turtle populations because of turtles getting caught in between the metal rails? Good question. And I believe that we will go ahead and wrap it up there. If you have any okay. final comments, Jordan, thank you for joining us, everyone, and I will see you next time. Yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, I, I love, I'm passionate about turtles. David and all of us at the TSA are very passionate about what we do. Uh, we live and breathe turtle conservation. 
Uh, I hope you enjoyed this webinar. I hope it, it brought to light some new things, maybe some things for you to think about. And if it did, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we would like to further interact with you. And if you're interested in starting a uh, community-based or a, you know, a citizen science project that deals with road issues wherever your community may be, we would love to be there right from the beginning helping you uh, start that initiative uh, with uh, those in our umbrella that is the Turtle Survival Alliance. So with that, um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you may be, and we will see you on our next TSA webinar. So thank you very much. Bye, everyone. All right, good night.